20 student assembly. For those of you that are new students, we do this once a semester, and it's the one time during each semester that we can get all of our students together, new students, all the way to the ones that are finishing up. Uh, so welcome. Just a quick um, agenda, what's going to happen today as far as agenda, we have a guest, guest speaker. Uh, we'll follow that by faculty, staff, introductions. Uh, Chef Matt will come up and do some uh, announcements, talk about competition. Uh, then we'll do scholarships. We will award a lot of scholarships. And then I believe we will do raffles. So we have about six or seven items that will be raffled off. All right? So um, I want to start by introducing Haley, Haley Matson Mathis. She's the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. This is a nonprofit that supports culinary education from post-secondary, like you. They go to every campus statewide, six of the culinary campuses statewide to do programs like this. Uh, they also have other programs that she'll talk about. They also support high school culinary programs as well as professionals. So professional chefs and cooks um, are afforded opportunities to go to some professional development. Um, and I'd like Haley to introduce, um, talk about the program as well as our guest speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, the Hawaii Culinary Foundation is a nonprofit, and I'm the executive director, as Don said. Don serves on the Hawaii Culinary Foundation board. And as I mentioned, when I come to your campus, we're really here because of all of you. Our goal is to support what you're learning here on the campus and to support your instructors who come up with the great ideas like Chef Abby did today for our program. And we do these programs at each of the community colleges, but to introduce ingredients, experts, and ideas to you that you don't get in your day-to-day -day classroom experience. We also do the chef mentoring program at the high schools, and our focus is really just to elevate the bar for culinary education in Hawaii, and we look at all of you as the future of the Hawaii culinary and hospitality and food service industry going forward. So we're very proud of what you're doing on your campus here and of your instructors. You have one of the best programs, and I hope you recognize that in the state. We're very delighted with the program today that Chef Abby recommended because we have with us an expert that has so much knowledge to share with you and background in the coffee industry, Dr. Sh Dr. Sean Steinman. And he has written for numerous publications and trade journals, as well as the author of a book, The Hawaii Coffee Book, and the title that I love, The Little Coffee Know-It-All, a miscellany of growing, roasting, and brewing, uncompromising, and unapologetic. He has also the co-author and, and editor and author of Coffee, a comprehensive guide to the bean, the beverage, and the industry. His coffee research includes the production of coffee, the entomology of it, the physiology, biochemistry, as well as the brewing and the quality of coffee. He consults um, here in Hawaii, but he is also internationally and his expertise um, as co-founder of Daylight Mind Coffee Company. So his coffee firm um, offers its expertise to both farmers we were talking earlier, as well as roasters and producers. Today he's going to give you a tour through coffee, a tasting of coffee, and some knowledge about coffee. And as future culinarians, it's a great way to start um, uh, off your semester by learning from the best in the industry. Dr. Sean Steinman. Thank you. Oh, so sweet. Thank you. You can ignore everything she said. <laughs> All you have to know is that I really like coffee and I like to talk about it. Everything else is just paper. So, um, there were two ways we could have had this talk today. One could have been here's what you have to know about coffee to make a decent cup of coffee. And I've totally thrown that one out the window. The one I am going to give you is why you as a chef, and presumably someone who will work in a restaurant, should care about coffee. Because I can't teach you everything you need to know to make a good cup of coffee today. Well, I could, but you're going to forget it all tomorrow, so why bother? And those, there are books and websites and all sorts of stuff to make that happen. I'm happy to entertain questions throughout. I will try to leave space for questions. Um, I'm happy to hang out a little bit afterwards. If uh, you guys want to chat then, you can always call me and email me. I'll have my contact up information up later. 
I want to apologize to everybody on this side who can't really see the screen. I come from an academic background where we use lots of presentations, so this is what I did and had never been here before, so I apologize. Uh, luckily, most presentations really should just support what you're saying and not tell what you're saying, so you can just hear my beautiful voice and fall in love with coffee. All right, and I don't have my screen, so I gotta keep turning. All right, future chefs of the world. You're all learning about food and ingredients and sourcing, and you're gonna get crazy about your wine and your cocktails, and that's it. Coffee, sadly, our favorite drink is always neglected. We're gonna talk a little bit about why and hopefully convince you that maybe it shouldn't be. So most people who are consuming coffee in a restaurant, it's the last thing they taste. So this is your parting words to them, if you will, your parting taste. You should make it something they want to remember. Coffee's not hard, right? I don't have a degree in rocket science. I have a degree in horticulture, which has nothing to do with making coffee. And yet I can still make a decent cup of coffee, right? It's not anything to stress over. And let's be honest, relatively speaking, coffee is pretty cheap. If your cost of a cup of coffee is a dollar, then you're spending way too much on a coffee. It's going to be much less in most cases. All right, so why am I here and why are you suffering through this? One, let's be honest, coffee can be really good. Presumably you all care about tasting things, that's why you're here. Here's one more thing you can care about and can dive down its deep, beautiful, dark rabbit hole of. What you purchase as a person who creates food can make a difference. And this is the one sentence which is going to refer to how we support food systems and how we support farmers and how we make choices with our dollar. That's obviously a whole other lecture, but here it gets one sentence. But it's really important, right? How we choose to be shapes the world we live in. Everything that you serve in your restaurant defines your restaurant. It's a part of it. If one thing is outrageously different, that's going to be part of the identity. And maybe that's what you want. That's OK. Just be aware. Coffee's profitable. We're going to have a couple of slides about the dollars, because let's be honest, we all have to live and we all have to be successful. So we would need to know some of that. But really, as I told Chef Don when he asked me to come do this, my motivation is purely selfish. I'm tired of going to restaurants and spending good money and drinking really lousy coffee. If I can convince all the chefs of the world to make good coffee, then my life will be better, because then I can go get coffee when I'm out. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about coffee quality. That's really like four lectures. We're going to talk about coffee in restaurants. Obviously, that's why we're here. We'll do some numbers, and then I'll do a couple of quick, here's how you go on the path towards making this something as part of your establishment. Right, like I said earlier, most of the things I'm going to say today, you're not going to remember tomorrow. That's just the nature of the beast. But if you can walk away with the direction to move into, then we're, we've done our job. All right. Good coffee versus bad coffee. There's uh, too much to say in that. I'm just going to say it's tricky, because what I like and what you like are almost certainly different. So how we define good and bad individually is, of course, challenging. This is true about any food, right? Whether we go to McDonald's or whether we go to Alan Long's, it doesn't matter. What really is important is that whoever is making the decision makes it and makes it knowingly. Right? If you're going to choose everything, choose everything with the knowledge of what you didn't choose. That is perhaps the greatest tool you have anywhere in life, not just in running a business. But be cognizant, use your resources, make a good choice. And ultimately, if any one part of your business reflects on the identity of that business, then your coffee, in this case, should match the rest of your restaurant. If you want to serve coffee that kind of tastes like dirty water, then I hope your food tastes like dirty water. Actually, oh no, we'll get there next. I have a really funny slide about that. I'll just pat myself on the back while I'm at it. All right, so let's talk about quality in a very general, very vague, very simple term. In most things we talk about quality, we have some idea of a continuum, right? Some really gross and bad to really interesting and complex and amazing. That's an arbitrary continuum. Experts create them because experts like this weird, far end, esoteric, complex, whatever food drink thing. And everything below that they think is swill. But there's something to be said for those 
different experiences being different and knowing how they're different. So let's talk about coffee in relation to something which I now realize you might be too young to have much experience with, which is alcohol. Hopefully we can get away with this. All right, so the, the low end of a coffee continuum is going to have things that are canned coffees, pre-ground, pre-packaged, made in bulk, Folgers, U-Ban, Maxwell House, things you get in the grocery store that are incredibly cheap. Let's, we can analogize that to box wine made to get the drug across sometimes in a sense of a flavor that is recognizable. Then you move up to somewhere which has got a little more complexity to it, a little more access, maybe a little more price. And you sort of just keep walking up this. As you walk up this chain, you get up towards more complexity and you get up towards usually more price. Because we either value things with complexity more so we pay more for them, or they actually cost more to produce so they deserve a higher price. So with coffee, uh, it could be microbrews, it could be high-end wines, it can be a really fancy watch. Like everything has this continuum. And your job is to understand this continuum and choose from it knowingly and willfully. So I have sort of three generic categories of these things. We have hot caffeinated beverage, right? something that's full of drug, and it's hot, and it reminds you of this thing called coffee. And in most restaurants, it tends to be not memorable, maybe uh, even not um, worthy of being served in the establishment. Then you have another category of things that it's totally coffee-like. It's unremarkable, it's unmemorable, it gets the job done, it's usually very cheap, and it's something that people expect because they don't expect much of coffee. And then you have coffee, of course, which someone's gonna drink and be like, whoa, I need to stop for a second. I need to think about what I'm putting in my mouth because this is not what my grandmother drank. This is better, and I need to think about it and enjoy it. Obviously, I come from the third category here. Like, I'm super coffee geek, just let's be honest about it. I'm way on the edge there. A little judgmental, I admit, but less than I used to be. But to give you a context of food, right, restaurants don't serve frozen TV dinners. At least I hope they don't. So I can do that at home. If I'm going out and getting something that I'm not doing myself, it should be most of the time something I can't do myself easily or affordably. Right? Or, or it's so much better that I'm willing to spend more for it or it's different than what I'm gonna have. We need to think about what we're offering people and remember what we're trying to do. Of course, coffee's neglected all the time. Most of the time, if you're a restaurant and you're serving coffee, the people who really are doing it well, or let me rephrase that, people who are really successful with coffee are the people who serve breakfast. Because caffeine, drug, keeps you awake, people don't drink much at night. Fools, I say, but they don't. And most of the restaurants that do breakfast and brunch are the ones who are killing it with coffee. By midday, sales taper off. People get worried about caffeine. And by dinner, right, we're talking about a trickle. Very few dinner restaurants have a serious flow of coffee through it. Doesn't mean you should neglect your coffee. On the other hand, you can actually do great things with coffee at a restaurant at night, and you should. So how do we do coffee in a restaurant? Well, there's sort of three general ways. There's drip, which is what we're going to have today. Drip is where you just have water fall through a bit of grounds. It's what everybody's most familiar with. It can be something where you have a giant machine, like you have in the kitchen here. It can be a single serving machine. It can be anything in between. It can be pods, whatever. Drip is gravity doing the work. Then we have espresso. Espresso is fancy pantsy still in our culture, even though it's been around for over a century in our, in our planet. It's fancy pantsy because it requires skill and it requires fancy equipment. And to do it right really demands that someone cares about it and does it right. And there's a third option, which ends up being fancy restaurant version, which is French press or full immersion, where you have this water and coffee stuck together that serves you at the table. It looks beautiful. It's made for you. You can charge an arm or leg for it. And unfortunately, it also is still not very good. But it should be. It should be. So in case you, you know, this just supports what I've been saying. Restaurants generally have bad coffee. And it can be bad for a lot of reasons. It can be bad because it was always going to be bad. It came that way. It can be bad because it's stale. Right? Coffee is like other ingredients. It has a time frame where its greatest intensity exists, and then it slowly tapers and disappears. And that can happen before you even get the coffee into your restaurant. Tragic. It can be brewed poorly. I see this all the time. Or it could have been brewed a long, long time ago. And I know people think it's in the thermos, it's gonna last forever. No, it does not last forever. It changes, right? There's a, there's a sense that I'm conveying is that there's an optimum point. And, some, and we could argue there's an optimum point of what coffee, a single coffee should taste like. And that's an important basis for our conversation because 
change is not necessarily bad, but it's real. And people who are fanatical about something notice change, and they, they care about it. And you, of course, can't make something for everybody, but you need to make something that you can get behind always, and that most people, hopefully your customers, will also get behind. <laughs> Uh, I do want to talk about espresso again because it does require a skill to make espresso. It's one of the only things in coffee that really you have to train for, you have to practice. Pouring hot water over a bed of coffee, not so hard. Like We can do that in three minutes. But espresso and doing it well takes time and practice and therefore most restaurants probably never want to do it. And the last part is, uh, you know, you have these big machines, they do magic for you, they need uh, love and attention, they rarely get them because it's coffee and coffee never gets love and attention in a restaurant. And I know, so Daily Mind Coffee Company is a restaurant, roastery cafe, uh, bakery that I owned on the Big Island for a few years. It no longer exists, unfortunately. But I've been in the restaurant business. I know all the gore, I know all the joy. Um, things are busy. You've got a lot on your plate. Some things ne ne neglected and coffee's if we weren't a coffee shop, coffee would have been neglected in our place, too. All right, so story is coffee good, yet people ignore it. Why is that? I'm going to run through this, and then we're going to have uh, more details on future slides. So people don't drink coffee at night, mostly true. Customers don't care. Chefs and owners don't care. Labor is expensive for those things that require lots of people to manage. Equipment is expensive. Coffee drinking slows turnover, right? Less turnover, less dollars. And of course, people don't think coffee's profitable. All right, let's tear these apart one by one. Okay, people don't drink coffee at night. When I was a kid, and I'm not that old, so it wasn't that long ago, my mother would have dinner parties and always several pots of coffee were made. It's just what we did, we drank coffee at night. And now that doesn't seem to happen as much as it used to. People are afraid of caffeine. Tragic. So that's true, a lot of people don't drink coffee at night. All right, we can get around that. You can change what you think of coffee service in a restaurant to accommodate. They certainly won't drink it at night if it doesn't taste good. Right? If you're giving them bad stuff, all the more reason for them to use caffeine as an excuse. Of course, we're way past the battle days of decaf being disgusting. Decaf is good, or it can be good, just the way coffee can be good. Not any old decaf's gonna be good, you've gotta find it, just like any old coffee isn't going to be good. But if you want to incorporate this thing into your experience, it's doable. People will come. All right, customers don't care about the quality of coffee. Often true. I should have written often true. Most people don't have a level of um, depth and experience and joy of coffee that um, coffee geeks do. Wine is like the big grandfather of specialty things, right? Everyone cares about wine. And now people are starting to care about cocktails. Coffee's still mostly neglected, but it can have that level of experience. And so there are customers who care, there are customers who seek it out. But I want to remind you that customers don't really care about house-made pickles any more than they care about coffee. And yet, restaurants make house-made pickles on their own ketchup and they make their own bread. Restaurants care a lot about a lot of things. So why not also care about the coffee? Specialty coffee, which is better coffee, which is geeky coffee, sort of stuff I dabble in, there's a growing market, has been growing for decades. It is a real thing. Big money goes into specialty coffee companies, big venture capitalists. We have more coffee shops in Honolulu now serving geeky coffee than we did 10 years ago when I wrote my book the first time. Things are changing rapidly. There's no reason why you shouldn't be a part of that change. And at the end of the day, if you're the cool restaurant doing the yummy coffee, you are not gonna be the restaurant across the street who you're competing for customers for. Right, you got to set yourself apart. This is the easiest way to do it, the cheapest way to do it. And, you know, on those nights when your dishwasher didn't come in, you're staying behind to wash dishes, you're going to have good coffee to help you. All right, this one's for you guys. Chefs and owners don't care because there were customers yesterday, and there's no one ever taught them they should care. Of course, every single one of you sitting here listening to me no longer gets this excuse because now you have some hoity toity experts saying, drink coffee, it's good. So now you can think about it. Because chefs have never been taught that coffee is something to think about, you probably drink not so great coffee either. I did too. I drank bad beer. I drank bad cheese. I mean, I ate bad cheese. There's all sorts of things that I ate that I th now think of as bad that now I would never eat again because it's just not that, 
stimulating or exciting and interesting to me. And right, if you didn't care about interesting and stimulating and exciting and compelling, you wouldn't be here wearing these beautiful white coats. There are too many things to deal with in a restaurant. 100% true. There's always something going wrong. There's always one more thing to hassle with. So what? Right? If you're going to own it, own it. Make your life a little bit harder for it to be that much more enriched, that much more interesting, that much more wonderful. Yeah, so you lose five more minutes of sleep. So you have three extra headaches a day. Right? It happens. I promise it's worth it. This is really an emotional plea here. There's no, there's no good argument there. Uh, people say it's complicated. Coffee's really not complicated. I mean, hot water, coffee grounds. It's not complicated, guys. I have a three-year-old, and most mornings she helps me make coffee. Right? If my toddler can help me make coffee, any adult can do it, I promise. And of course, you can make the argument, oh, there's all these things going on, and coffee's not that profitable. It is profitable. Is it that profitable? We will see. And of course, that's something you, every restaurant will have to, to vie with, right? It's not like there's a one, one price fits all, one shoe fits all the coffee. Labor and equipment is expensive. Yes, labor is always expensive. End of story, right? Um, in a restaurant, you have all kinds of equipment. I walked through your kitchen today. There's all kinds of stuff in there a restaurant owner has to lease or own or deal with. These things break. They require more money. Relatively speaking, your coffee equipment is pocket change. right? You could get a very solid coffee set up for, I don't know, $1,500. And that's if you want like big bulk equipment. You could totally get by with $100 of investment, maybe $200 if you're really stretching it to like do a really good coffee program. This is an easy thing, guys. Um, you don't need a professional barista. If you're doing espresso, maybe you should consider it. If you have a cafe in your restaurant, obviously you do. But you don't need to do everything in this very high top, top of the mountain experience. It's just not necessary. It's not worth it. It won't make sense. That's not your business. Your business is not coffee. So keep that in mind. Keep the perspective in mind. As I said, espresso, exception. And if you're going to do espresso, do it right or don't do it at all. Because lots of people are going to come in there and taste it and be like, eh, I can get this somewhere else. All right, drinking coffee slows turnover. If turnover is your thing, then yeah, maybe it might slow it down because people hang out. Uh, but if people get coffee, they're probably going to get dessert. Or if they're going to get dessert, maybe they'll get coffee. Right? This is an upcharge that's really easy for you. And that's a pretty picture. It came from my restaurant. Those things are real, or were real. People will stick around and enjoy themselves and spend more money if you give them the opportunity and the reason to. Right? Cocktail, fancy meal, coffee, dessert. Bam. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. All right, let's talk money. It's a very complicated looking spreadsheet. It's not. It's not really. All right, bottom left-hand corner are the assumptions, right? The strength of the coffee, how much coffee you go through in a week, blah, blah, blah. The time of day at which you're serving coffee will heavily influence how much coffee you go through. These numbers are really morning numbers. Night numbers are a little different. So, um, Going across the columns, it's the cost per pound to you. 1750, 1250, 650. And let's just assume that the prices are commensurate with level of complexity of the cup or where it's sourced from, because we're Hawaii and we have to talk about Hawaii somewhere, and we're gonna talk about it very soon. Going down the rows, we have how much you're charging per cup of coffee. Three dollars, five dollars, or eight dollars. And the numbers in the middle are the combination of those two. How much are you making if you're charging that much for a cup of coffee? This is per week, right? So um, if you're charging five cups of coffee a week and you're only paying twelve fifty per pound, you know, you might be making two thousand dollars a week on coffee. Right? You've already paid for your equipment the first week if you're doing that. That's week one. You're gonna be open forever. Where's the argument here? Now, the beautiful thing about this is that just because I've made this beautiful complete chart doesn't mean it really works. If your coffee is really expensive, you can't charge the cheapest price. And if your coffee is really cheap, you probably can't get away with charging a high price for it. So the empty spaces are where I've taken out the things that probably aren't going to work. The middle column, of course, is where the, the happy spot is, where you are spending a little bit less on your coffee, and you're making pretty good profit no matter where you go. Just one example, right? If you're a dinner restaurant, you're not going to be going through 20 pounds of coffee a week. But you can also get by with 
12 15 dollars for your coffee then really swank it up just a brief illustration there's money to be had here let's talk about hawaii cuz gosh we all live here and isn't it great and it's expensive to live here we all know that and everything here for us or produced here is more expensive than everywhere else and coffee is no exception just to give you like a concept of of coffee prices relative to the rest of the world it's coffee if you were to if you bought thousands of pounds of coffee at a time and you roasted coffee and you bought coffee from generic country x you're going to spend about i mean if you were splurging most of the time a dollar 50 per unroasted pound is what you're going to spend dollar 50 an unroasted pound someone's got to roast it of course and ship it to you so like your end up costs as a, as a restaurant are much higher hawaiian coffee that unroasted pound the very cheapest I know about in Hawaii, it's $12 a pound. So a, an entire factor more expensive before it even gets roasted, before it even gets handled many more times and gets to your restaurant. Our coffee is expensive, but a whole lecture here, our coffee is probably a more reasonable price for coffee for the product and the labor than everywhere else in the world. We're not overpriced, everybody else is incredibly underpriced. That aside, right, there's a social statement to be made there, is being made there. We're in Hawaii. Buy local, support your farmers is an important real thing. And you can see the 1750 was actually made because an expensive wholesale Hawaiian coffee is for you is going to be 1750 a pound. It's not that bad. You still make money off it. Even if $5 a cup, it's worth your doing. If $8 or $10 a cup, it's really worth your doing. It seems a lot when you're paying that invoice at the beginning of, of the month, but if you're planning and preparing, you can produce a really good cup for your customers and support your local community all in one. Just have to expect it, accept it, and prepare for it. All right, solutions. Before I talk about solutions, I'm going to cue the workers in the back to start pouring coffee. Because we're going to taste four coffees. Right? There is some notion that I was going to do a demo of making coffee here, but how water and water, guys. I'm happy to do demos, but I think this is more important. So I've spent the last hour making coffee for you in the kitchen. And we have four different coffees. We're going to drink them all. We're going to talk about them all um, in good time. But before we start getting all chatty, I'm not done. I'm not done. Got a few more slides before we get to taste things. And we'll talk about tasting things, and then there'll be time for some questions, which I, I hope you have. All right. So hopefully I've made a reasonably convincing argument that you should at least think about coffee a little bit. The problem is none of your classes have anything to do with coffee, which is a great tragedy, of course. Um, so you have to take it upon yourself to solve this problem. And there's lots of ways of solving it. The first way to ever solve a problem is to focus on the solution. The solution is knowledge. Learn about this stuff. And really, I hate to say this, but learning about coffee, you can get by with just a little bit to do a really good job. You can go down the rabbit hole. I am there. It is a wonderful place to be, but you don't have to. You've got to learn about other things, too. So, how do you learn? Take a coffee class. They exist. And if you ask people who have knowledge, they will teach it to you. Find a good roaster, right? You need to buy coffee from somewhere. The place you buy it from is this. If you choose wisely, you'll probably get all the information you need, which, of course, is not helping my, my future business. Hire a consultant. That's one of me, right? You can just hire someone who can help you learn all this, essentially the things you need to know right away. Obviously, there's a cost there, but it's a way of doing it. Or read books. It also seems very self-serving because I've written some books, but most of my books are more in-depth than, than you need for a restaurant. There are lots of things to read. The problem with reading things is that you have to be able to trust the source. So the internet, always a little sketchy. You should always be very wary. I hope you hear that a lot from all your classes because it's true. Books that are printed by a publisher, better, but not guaranteed to be great. So just when you find information, try to trust it. Find ways to trust it. And if you don't trust it, don't trust it. All right, so once you have enough knowledge to move forward, you need to find good coffee. And that means not buying through the generic distributor because they're not about coffee. They're about giving you the things you need. And they don't have time to know about everything. If you're going to care about coffee, buy it from someone who cares about the coffee. And there's lots of, of ways of sussing out who a good source is. A couple of rules of thumb. If the person who roasts the coffee knows when it was roasted, you're probably just fine. 
I mean, if they say Azorosa six months ago, then maybe you're fine because you know not to use them. They should know things about the coffee. Where is it from, for example? Or how is it processed? If, they're, if they know more things, like what variety is it? Or what the farmer's name is, then you're almost guaranteed that it's going to be pretty solid stuff. Now, if you find someone, a roaster or some other connection that's going to help you supply this, chances are if they know this much stuff about the coffee, they want you to buy it and they want you to be successful. They're going to give you advice, they're going to give you knowledge. A lot of wholesalers for coffee will give free education because they want their product represented really well. Now, I want to take a side step to talk about equipment. Because someone once upon a time in the coffee world said, I want people to buy my coffee. But there's a gazillion competitors out there. How do I, what's my edge? What's my secret? And their secret was to give the restaurants the equipment, the grinder and the brewers and the thermoses and everything. And they said, here's this free equipment. You're a restaurant. It's expensive. You know what? I'll even clean it for you and take care of it if it breaks. One less thing to worry about. All you have to do is pick your finger with blood and sign this contract. And voila, you have coffee coming to you on a regular basis with machines you don't have to worry about. And it's a dream for a restaurateur or a chef. Except it's almost always lousy coffee. And you get stuck in that trap, and it's hard to get out of. I mean, uh, it's judgmental, I admit. But if you're going to care, care. And know that if someone is big enough and indiscriminate enough to be able to give you equipment, then maybe you should ask the question why, and if that's, a, if that's what you want to do. And the answer might still be yes, and that's OK. I'm not going to drink your coffee, but lots of people will, and that's OK. Not every restaurant has to be everything to everybody. Really important thought. And a restaurant is not your own kitchen. Remember that, too. If there's cups of coffee left over, I want to try them all, too, please. Um, so I highly encourage people to own your own equipment. The basic equipment is not that expensive. Will it break? Yeah, things break, but so does your oven. Thank you so much. Everything breaks, but everything can be fixed. I once had a, a potential customer who said, I want to get rid of my coffee. I'm buying this coffee. They give me the machine. They service the machine. I'll buy my own equipment. I want to buy your coffee. It's so good. I was thrilled because he was a breakfast place, and he pumped through a lot of coffee. This is a great deal. And then he said, but can you fix it right away? Like, what do you mean? Well, if it breaks during service, I get a lot of money from coffee. I need it to be fixed instantly. I said, no, I'm a tiny roaster. I'm not a repair shop. I can't do that. And he had a fair point, right? This is an important part of his business. But because of this system of big, faceless roaster providing equipment, right? he was locked into this belief that he had to do this. There's actually many solutions to how your, what happens when your coffee breaks, if your machine breaks. And the first one is they rarely break, actually. <laughs> it's just hot water coming through some tubes and dripping. It's not much to break. It happens, but not often. And there are solutions. And if you're worried about big, fancy equipment, don't buy big, fancy equipment. You can have a coffee program that uses small, bespoke equipment, right, where you brew the coffee for the person or for a group of people, or you just brew it in a, a big amount and you pour it into a thermos. There's lots of ways of getting around this. Everything breaks. Everything needs cleaning. It's just one more thing. And I know simplifying is good, but I'm a coffee person, so I can't say let coffee be the thing you're simplifying. This is the thing I care about. All right. Last time to hammer this idea about espresso into your heads. Don't do it if you're not going to do it well. There are machines that will do everything for you, right? You push the magic button, you put the coffee and the water in, you push the magic button, out comes espresso. That's actually a good solution in some cases. Is it the utmost experience you're going to get? Probably not. Is it better than what most people are going to get in most places? Surprisingly, yes. But still thinking about where the coffee is coming from and how fresh it is and all these other factors. Don't get the pods. Avoid the pods. Bad. Not what you want for a fancy restaurant. I think in most cases, espresso is not the way to go. Even in an Italian restaurant, Italians invented espresso, so we associate all Italian restaurants with espresso. And we associate it with Italian companies like Illy and Lavasa, who are ginormous global companies, whose coffee, by the time you get it, is probably already six months old. And it's more expensive than buying from your local roaster but they give you the machine and the service. So, yeah. Learn about espresso if you're going to think about it. Right? That's all I ask. Go in with your eyes wide open. Look at this. We're almost there. Have we all drank coffee? Are we ready for more coffee? Because we got four coffees to drink. All right, bring it on, team.
You don't get to know anything about the coffees until we're done. There's a word for that. It's called bias. And if I tell you what they are now, you're going you're gonna to already have conclusions before you even taste them. All right. So here is the, uh, you know, you have to conclude things all the time. The last summary paragraph of, a, of an essay. Good coffee can be done. I've done it. I've had it in various other places. It can be profitable. We need profit. Yay, money. It does take a little bit of knowledge, but knowledge is a good thing. Clearly, you're all here in school, so you're not afraid of that. And, you know, you serve a burger, they serve a burger. Why am I going to choose you? Because of your coffee. And of course, because I love all things food, not just coffee and chocolate and alcohol. I love tea, too. So anything I said here about coffee is true about tea, except tea equipment's even ridiculously cheaper. And tea is ridiculously cheaper than coffee is. Tea is really what our country should be focusing on. I don't know why we haven't embraced that yet. All right, so um, thank you all. This is the, if you want to contact me and ask questions, I'm happy to engage. Um, after we drink, and while we're drinking, because we have several coffees to go, I'm going to entertain questions. So thank you. My name is Sean. Please feel free to call me Sean. Don't worry about the doctor part. Although it is cool to hear it, I admit, but it's not that important. All right, thank you. All the coffees are coded, so we don't know what they are yet. But basically, one, two, three, four now. I had this vision they were all going to be in front of you. Like I, I didn't know where we were going to be. I thought we'd be in like a lecture hall with tables. We could have all four of them. No such luck. All right. Why do I spell coffee with an A? I like this person. Any guesses? So years and years ago when I came up with this name, um, never in a million years did I put coffee and tea together. But everybody does that because nobody knows what the heck coffee is. So the coffee and tea is a beautiful, beautiful unity. I wish that I had thought of that before I chose the name. Coffee is the genus that coffee's in. My training as a scientist is in horticulture. I'm a plant scientist by training. I have a great love of geeky, deep knowledge of plants and plant physiology and ecology and all sorts of things. So when I decided to become a consultant, I realized that my experience was about coffee from the plant all the way to the drink. And so I chose cafe to encompass coffee as an idea versus coffee as a narrow path. So that's why it has an A on the end. It's a Latin, it's a Latin word. Go for it. In regards to what? Sweeteners. Sweeteners. All right. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was a real idiot. And I passed judgment on people who added milk and sugar to their beverages because I was a purist, and I believed everybody should be a purist. Well, I've gotten old since then, and a little more mature, a little wiser. And the truth is, I don't care how you drink your coffee. I want to drink my coffee my way, and you can drink it your way. My role of, as an expert is not to tell you what to drink. It's to guide you on your journey. Right? There's no such thing as good or bad. There's no such thing as right or wrong. And if anyone tells you otherwise, they don't really understand. It's OK to like something that I don't like. I like cheesecake a lot. It's my favorite dessert. But I just want cheesecake. Don't put chocolate on there, strawberry syrup, or lily koi drizzle. I don't, just give me cheesecake. I like cheesecake. I'm a purist, and that's fine. That's not what I want. But if you want to put caramel all over it, do it. If you want to put sugar and milk in your coffee, do it. One of my very favorite coffee people in all the world, his name is James Hoffman. Super, super famous guy, about my age, lives in London, has a roastery, he's been a champion, barista. Is, almost everything he says is pure gold. I love this guy. Such a groupie. I heard him give a talk once where he was addressing this idea. He says, you know, we coffee experts, we care so much about coffee. We really love it. We believe that it should be black. And we really secretly want everybody else to drink it the way we drink it. We really want you to. We don't talk about it loud because it's rude, but that's what we hope in our hearts of hearts. And yet, as cafe owners, what do we do? We say to ourselves, they should drink it black. But yet, we give away cream and sugar for free. Right? It's a total mixed message. And the reality is we want customers. And if we want customers, we have to either do one of two things. We have to have an ideal that we stick to, 
and we hope there are enough customers to join us. Or we have an ideal, maybe we're not doing so well, either we close our doors or we open our hearts a little bit. Um, there's a, the, the first cafe in Honolulu that was really a really high-end, crazy specialty coffee cafe it was called Beach Bum Cafe. It was downtown. There was an espresso machine and bespoke coffee, right? There was no batch brewer. Like, you came and you want a cup of coffee, he made you a cup of coffee for you. They were like one of six different ways. He only served Hawaiian coffee. And this guy was passionate, and his crew was passionate, and you might go in there and have to wait 30 minutes before you got your turn. Like, it was just slow. The coffee was good. He was following his ethic of buying local Hawaiian coffee, but it never made a profit. He just didn't have enough customers. So he couldn't sustain that. He closed, and I really admire him for not being able to make his vision come to fruition. He could have put in a batch brewery, could have had flavored syrups, which he had none of, by the way. He could have done a lot of things, but he made the choice to stick to his guns. It's a fine choice, but he's no longer open. And that's a fine choice, don't get me wrong, but there's an important place to understand what's important to you and how willing you are to open to other people. And there's no right answer there, right? I'm not saying you should buy frozen french fries and make frozen french fries and pour Heinz all over them. Go ahead and make that fancy ketchup. I'll be the first one at your table. Um, but there's different clients out there. There's different customers. People want different things. You have to know who you are, know what your boundaries are when you go into this business and be willing to adapt or not adapt. But you thought that was going to be a shorter answer, didn't you? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> guy just won't stop talking. So, how do I word this? How, um, from the time you open the bag, how long until it expires? Ah, freshness. Okay, let's talk about coffee freshness. Coffee is a, the coffee we trade in the world is unroasted green seed. If you saw it, you would never want to consume it because it's more like a dried bean than anything else. Someone has to add heat to it and roast it. From the minute it's roasted, it starts to change. Two things start to happen. It gives off gas, largely CO2, but some other things as well. And oxygen, that evil culprit, which keeps us alive, starts just degrading it. It's a little more complicated than that, but for most practical purposes, gas evolution and oxygen are what's ruining coffee. And the only way to stop these things from changing is to freeze time, or literally freeze the coffee at low temperature. And there's some contention about what that does or doesn't do. I can get there if you want. So the question then is, if coffee begins changing from the moment it becomes coffee, how long do we have before it's no longer coffee? And the academic answer is that coffee will never go bad in 90% of cases, 98% of cases, right? The coffee will never make you sick. The taste will change, but you can drink the coffee two years later, and it will still have caffeine in it, and it will still have some sense of what coffee is. But being a coffee snob and knowing your question was not about it making me sick, it was about how long do I have until it's no longer something I probably want to serve? Unfortunately, everyone's different, so everyone's measure of stale is going to be different. I'm on the extreme end because this is my livelihood. This is what I do have done for my whole existence. After a week or two, I can start to tell that coffee has changed. I'll still drink it. I still have coffee in my house that's maybe a month old. but like. I'm looking for friends to, p take, to pawn it off on by that point. <laughs> and my friends take that coffee, and it's the best coffee they've ever had. So there's a big you know, continuum. I think if you can keep a cycle of three weeks, you're doing a great job. So Saturday mornings, Kaka'ako Farmer's Market, I have a booth. I buy coffee from roasters around the state. I serve their coffee as brewed cups, and I sell their bags. Every week, I wish that every bag was bought and every bean was sold. It does not happen. So next week, I try and sell it again. No good. Third week, I'm getting antsy. And all my bags have roast dates, so I'm not fooling anybody. If by that point they're not sold, I brew them and just drink them. Because it's still pretty good. But you can't ask a customer to say, here, take this thing that I don't think is fresh anymore and sit on it for six weeks. It happens. When I was a graduate student, I kept in touch with my undergraduate advisor, who was a very important uh, role model for me and mentor. And he said, oh, you know, send me some coffee. So I roasted him some coffee in the lab I was working in. It was really special stuff. And by some coincidence, there was a student from the college in Hawaii at the time. So I said, gave it to her. And I said, hey, would you take this to this professor? She's like, yes. Like a month later, she finally gives it to him. And like three months later, she says, oh, I finally had it. It was great. Like four months later, like 
No. But he loved it, right? And part of loving something is the idea of it, and part of it is the actual physiochemical experience of it. I promise if you're charging someone $10 a cup for coffee, if they're not fanatical like I am, they're probably going to love it. If they know a little bit about coffee, it should be pretty decent, but, you know. So I'm going to tell an example, a story. Um, some years ago, we had a, an amazing number of freaky coffee experts in Hawaii. We still have some, a, a, a large number of coffee experts, but there's one time where a few of us were in town. We went to a restaurant here in Honolulu that has a great coffee program. And you know, these are the three worst customers you have to serve if you're going to be serving them coffee after a swanky, expensive meal. And we got three different coffees, and we hated all three of them. This is one of the few restaurants that has a coffee menu. And they charge a lot for these coffees, and we thought they were all terrible. Now, granted, the, probably the three most knowledgeable people about coffee in the state of Hawaii at the time. So it's a little unfair. But we still spent money on appetizers and alcohol and dinner. Like, we wanted that coffee to be good. It was a disappointment. You never know who your customers are. I'll never get coffee there again. <laughs> Other questions? We're in coffee three, right? Yeah. Four. 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 Are we on four? Four. Yeah. Oh, I just got three. All right. Four. I'm a little behind the curve. Mm. All right. Her first venue. As she gets stuck with the tray of coffee. Uh, because Nespresso is necessarily a lot more expensive than certain brands and not as easily accessible to buy because you either have to order it or go to Williams Sonoma in town. What is your opinion on Nespresso? I'm going to broaden that a little bit to be so the question was about Nespresso. Kind of hard to get, kind of expensive. It's usually a pod. So I'm going to go back to my previous statement that pods are bad. I mean, there's the environmental aspect, there's the quality aspect, there's the you're being lazy aspect. <coughs> but it could be Illy pods, it could be K cups, it could be an espresso, it could be any of these things, which are amazingly wonderful because they're so bloody convenient, right? <coughs> Stick it in, close it, push the button, you're done. Like, you can't get any simpler than that. And convenience is really important. They are relatively expensive to grinding and brewing your own, probably in the order of three to six times as expensive per, you know, unit of, of cup. <coughs> if what you care about is quality of everything, that's not the way to go. It's the convenient way to go, but it's not the quality way to go. It's not the experience way to go. Even though for many people it might still be better. Right? We've had three coffees. I hope you've noticed they've all been different. No right answer. I expect that everybody, if we asked everybody who liked the first one the most, who liked the second one the most, right, all four coffees are going to have a champion, which is fine. But they are very different coffees. So I really have to go back to, you know, Yes, I want everybody to serve coffee the way I serve it in my house in the morning, right? That's my, like, fantasy. But that's not realistic, right? I'm not going to go to Zippy's and get high-end coffee. I expect if I'm going to fine dining, the coffee should be at least the 1250 range, if not the 1750 range, right? That's my minimum expectation. Um, because coffee is that thing I love so much. Well, so I'm a foodie, right? I bake, a loaf, I bake sourdough from starter every week. I, bake, I make all the food in my house. I do all the cooking. I make all of our mustard. I make our condiments. I, I, I'm a freak, right? Like, the food's what I do. So yeah, prepackaged capsules is not for me. I'm never going to advocate that. But the reality is, I am not uh, ever going to be a coffee sample that is worth taking as a measurement. Because I'm so far on the tail of that curve that I'm an outlier. Whatever your establishment is, two things have to happen. You have to have enough customers, and you have to believe in what you're serving. If you believe in you know, Folgers that you found in your grandmother's basement from eight years ago, if you believe in that and you like it, that's what you should serve. <laughs> and everything I said, of course, is hogwash, which is true. I hope that's not the case. But you are the ones who will be in control. You get to make these decisions. Just make them knowingly. That's all I ask. Did you get your question? Yeah. Yep. So this is going to be a two-parter. So cool. uh, what's your opinion on Cuban coffee, and is it something profitable in the future? Cuban coffee? Yeah. As in coffee grown in Cuba or Cuban style? Cuban style coffee. I mean, if you're a French restaurant serving Cuban coffee, Cuban style coffee, eh, probably not so much. So there are places that grow coffee, like Cuba. 
like Thailand. Lots of places. There's like 80 countries that grow coffee. But there are places that grow coffee and have a, a Western interpretation of it, or they have their local culture, right? Cuban coffee style, which is heavy with sugar and milk, or, or you know, Thai Vietnamese coffee you get at restaurants, which is Sweden condensed milk and coffee. Like, it's an experience. It's not just black coffee. Wonderful things if you accept that it's cheesecake with caramel on it. People love it. It's like candy. Why not? What's not to love about it? It's popular if people, if the story is authentic, right? Don't be the Italian restaurant doing Cuban coffee. That's just because the chef wants to drink Cuban coffee and they think everybody should love it. Your restaurant is not your house, right? Separate those ideas right away. It has your personality and has your flair, but you can't have everything necessary that you love to the point you love it. Sometimes you got to chuck things away. So, yeah, uh, Cuban coffee is delicious as an experience. It doesn't belong everywhere, but it does belong some places. Don. So how do you brew your coffee at home? So let's go back to the question is how do I brew my coffee at home? I want to, before I answer that, revisit this notion that I have a toddler. So, uh, you know, we wake up in the morning and I have this monster I have to deal with, which is wonderful. I love her to pieces. But it also means I can't sit there slowly pouring water over coffee for me and my wife because we don't drink, you know, half a cup each. We make a full pot. So, like, I just don't have time for that. I have a really good home electric drip machine. Hot water, bed of coffee, what brand is that? <laughs> you know, if you had asked me yesterday, I would tell you, but this morning we saw that the carafe had a leak in it. And this is the second carafe we've had from this. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to recommend these guys anymore. Uh, it's OXO. So there are some, the, the secret to, uh, to, one of the secrets of coffee is getting the temperature right. It's not hard to get the water hot enough, but manufacturers, are lazy or cheap because to get it hot enough, you takes a little more cost of equipment. So really good home machines do exist. Like I have an OXO, there's Technivorm, there's some buns that work. There's actually a bunch that are actually good, a range of prices. But it's not like you know you're walking into Walmart to buy one of these. So I have a really good home machine. It just takes hot water, drips over coffee, and bam, it makes good coffee. I also put in good coffee. That's important too. Um, on the weekends, maybe I do a vacuum pot or I pull out the Chemex or I do a full immersion. Um, you know, my wife and I don't have perfectly aligned tastes with coffee, so I cater to her because that's what husbands do. Um, but there are lots of good ways to make coffee. Before my wife started paring down the things in our house, I had, I think, 10 ways of making coffee. <laughs> There's no right answer. Uh, how does roasting affect the caffeine levels? <sighs> it's a good question. I'm going to answer two questions, that one and the one you didn't ask that I hoped you'd ask. Okay, caffeine. The single most important factor of caffeine in the cup is the seed itself. Do we all have four coffees? I mean, I only got three coffees. Is there a fourth one that I was neglected because I'm not loved? <laughs> yeah. You know, Abby and I have known each other a long time. All right, so we actually have no idea what influenced the content of caffeine in coffee from the from an agricultural biochemical standpoint. Thanks, Abby. Um, we know that there's a huge variation, even within the species we most commonly drink, uh, there can be quite a large variation. And that variation, which is probably influenced by genetics and by environmental conditions and probably by things like for, you know, uh, farmer cultural practices and maybe other things we don't even know about yet. No one's looked into this. We just know that caffeine exists and that it varies between coffees. And it's probably the single most important thing that varies between coffees. You can influence it by how you brew the coffee, how much coffee you use to brew your coffee. But can you influence it with a roasting? The answer you should walk away with that's clean and succinct is no. It's a fudgy answer. Because if you look at the data, uh, you do see changes in caffeine as you roast darker and darker. I, in fact, had too much spare time as a graduate student and did such an experiment. And what I found in my experiment was that as I roasted from really, really light to really, really dark, there was a statistically significant difference in the amount of caffeine, where the light one had more caffeine than the dark one. Statistically significant, I said, not practically significant. Because when you calculate it out, how much caffeine was in each you know, eight ounce cup or 12 ounce cup of that, those coffees, it was a really small number. That small enough that in my educated opinion, if you drink a cup of coffee a day, your body's not going to know the difference. Like, it was that small a difference. Mathematically, yes, but practically, no. So maybe roasting has a role to play. We can show that caffeine leads and degrades 
in most cases, but so little of it that it's not really important. But this is one of the greatest myths of all time about coffee is that darker roasts have less caffeine. They do, but you know, not all journalists are good journalists and not all journalists say the whole truth. Hold on, one more. Let me answer the other question that I wanted you to ask, which was how does taste change with roast level? That is something very important to pay attention to. The same way a steak changes from rare to well done or broccoli changes from raw to burnt, right? There's a continuum of, of cooking here. And the more you cook something, the more the taste of cooking is, is inherited by the thing. And it gets to be enough, you start to taste roasty, burnt, char, smoky, whatever. Coffee does this too. When coffee's really light, whatever it's gonna taste like, it's all gonna be laid bare for you to taste, good or bad. And as you roast darker and darker and darker, known changes happen, but the biggest one is that you start to take on the flavor of roasting, and that's okay. Just be aware of that. So when you're thinking about your clientele and what you like, roasting is one of those things you really have to have some sense of. Chef Abby. Does how you brew the coffee make a difference to um, how much caffeine is in it? Does how you brew coffee make a difference to caffeine content? In most cases, no. So if we're talking French press versus drip, no, it's not making any difference. If we're talking espresso or some espresso-like system, yes. What I can't answer is, is it because the high pressure is pulling out more caffeine or because we tend to use more coffee when brewing those things? I haven't done that second experiment, but if you use more coffee, you're going to get more caffeine, like that much we know. But without using any extra pressure, it seems that there's the variation is, is minimal, statistically insignificant, if you will. Before we take more questions, obviously I'm happy to stand here all day and talk about coffee <laughs> to my heart's content, which is probably not your heart's content. I just want to make sure with the powers that be that we're, the time is right. I'm happy to you know, cut this one. Oh, we got to talk about the coffee first. Oh, my God. Yeah. Talk about the coffees first, and then I'll discreetly exit the stage. <clears throat> all right. So I actually got the U-Bend on sale. It was really cheap. That was the first coffee. They got more expensive as we go down the line, and they're sort of more specialized as we go down the line. Now, chances are, if you're used to coffees one and two, generally speaking, those are going to be your favorite. If you really care about the details of food and taste and experience, you probably are settling on three or four. Can you say it just a lot? Oh, yes, of course, because everyone can't see what's happening. So the first coffee was Uban. That goes in the categories of giant conglomerate canned coffees that came stale bef and gross before they even got to the place, um, any place. Next was uh, Royal Kona, a 10% Kona blend. This is the one that says Roy's on it, presumably what Roy sells. Number three was a blend of a Colombian, mostly Colombian, with some Thai coffee in it, um, roasted by two different roasters in Hawaii. And the last one was from a farm in Kau called Rusty's Hawaiian. The problem is with this sort of taste test or taste experience is that there are many reasons why these coffees are different, right? Where the coffees are from, the varieties, the species, how they're grown, blah, 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 this, the freshness, the roasting, the inheritance, all sorts of things are different. No right answer. But did they all taste different? Yeah. That is the most important thing, right? Someday when you need to buy coffee for yourself or for your business, you're going to find some wonderful person who's going to work with you to sell you this thing, and you're going to taste all their things. And if they don't want you to taste all their things, don't work with them. If they want you to be happy, so they should fuss over you a little bit. Taste everything. Choose wisely. Choose knowingly. You'll be fine. All right, I need to leave because you guys have way other cool things to do. Thank you so much for suffering through this. I really appreciate it. Drink more coffee. <laughs>